Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we might feel this same sense of your goodness and your glory and your power every day of the year. And that we celebrate your birth and what it has meant to mankind and what it will mean throughout eternity. We love you this morning. We bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. God bless you all. May be seated. Thank you so much. Beautiful presence of the Lord. Thank God. Amen. He is a great and a mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Last chance we'll have to be together before or until after Christmas. So. But I do hope that everybody has a great time with your families and uh, however you can work that out. It's awkward and kind of weird this year, but nevertheless, uh, the celebration is the same. We celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ has come and brought salvation to all of mankind that will receive it. Yeah. And uh, what, a, what a thing to celebrate. Right. Praise God. So Merry Christmas to you and your families. Hope you all enjoy your time together. And that you do get time to spend with them, uh, however that works out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, you know, uh, my dog died here, what, two years ago? Two years ago. Now. Great dog. I mean, that dog was just so laid back. and He was great with the kids and all that stuff. But just a good, probably the best dog I've had in my entire life. And we've had a bunch. But, you know, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dark, it's too dark to read. <laughs> Guy asked me, he said, what do you call a deer with no eyes? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's been weird times. We haven't been able to go out and do a lot together. Sally and I all, you know, I mean, we go out, but not out to eat and things like we used to do because you, it's almost everything's carry out and you get in there and you, it's awkward trying to eat and everything else. But. So she asked me, and you know, we have different tastes, obviously. She likes to antique and shop and do things like that, and I don't. I like to watch football games and praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, she asked me to describe my idea of a perfect date. You know how men and women just aren't on the same page a lot of times? Thank you, Jane. I knew, I knew I'd get an amen from that one. But, um, so she asked me to describe my idea of a perfect date, and I said, well, that's a tough one. I'd have to say April 25th, because it's not hot, it's not too cold, it's just right for a light jacket, you know. She didn't speak to me for a week. But I'll give you, in closing here with this, I'll give you a good rule for life. When it comes to plastic surgery and sushi, never be attracted by a bargain. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. God is good. And uh, I'm excited for this season. I'm excited for the closing of this year because I know God has got some tremendous things in our future. And uh, it's going to be exciting and interesting and probably challenging uh, in the year to come. But uh, God's got the answers. And all we have to do is put our confidence and our trust in him. And we'll see the outcome that we know it will be. The scripture says in, in Isaiah 91, I was thinking when everybody was talking, there's a, I think it's verse 8, it says, we will behold the reward of the wicked. Yes. Praise the Lord. We don't have to make it happen. All we have to do is just trust the Lord and we'll see the consequences yes. in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. So let's begin this morning with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 3, and he said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now I've got just written in pen here, and I don't know when I wrote this years ago, I'm sure, because this Bible is about to fall apart. But natural light, and he also says revelation. Now Jesus is the light of the world. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And that light came into this world to reveal not just a universe, not just spatial areas and so forth, but to reveal God himself. Jesus is that light. And eventually he, will, he comes into the world himself, just as light came 
in the creation, the light of God comes into our lives to recreate, to create new people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Born again people, spiritual people, eternal people. So God said, let there be light. And there was light. A revelation of all that God wanted this earth to be and for man. Amen. So then let's go to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through, 20, through 38. I'm sorry, Peter. Luke 1, 26 through 38. And I was talking to uh, Ron and uh, Don just a little bit before church, and I said I, I, the message I have, it is a Christmas message, but it's unorthodox. It's not the typical one, which is probably not too surprising to most of you, but as far as who, where it's coming from. But I'm just saying... I, I, I want to maintain that is the reason we're here to celebrate that birth. Yeah. But also for us to understand there's more to it than just a baby in a manger. Yeah, yeah. More to it than just a understanding that God has come to bring salvation. But this whole Bible wants us to understand what the purpose of this is. And why we are to walk in the truth of his word and how that changes things. Right. It isn't just enough to believe that there's a God. Suzanne mentioned it. That's it's religion. I mean, you can say, well, I believe in God, but, you know, he's, he's not interested in our stuff. You know, he's, he's far and distant. Uh, it, it's kind of like a deist, you know, they believe that there's a God, but they don't believe that he's interested in, in them or anything that they're doing. And that's, that's where religion feeds off of that. So in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, beginning of verse 26, he said, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which, praise the Lord, that holy thing uh, which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Mm -hmm. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed her. So a word came from the Lord, and it produced a Savior because somebody believed it. God wasn't going to force Mary to receive this. He came to her because he knew she had faith, that, he, that she was a believer, but she still had to respond to that word. And because she did, that word became flesh. It manifested it became a revelation of God. So let's look again quickly in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Verse 14. And the word was made flesh, or manifest. And it dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It says, we beheld his glory. So in John 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, 
the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So faith in his word glorifies God. Because it becomes your truth. It's truth whether it becomes yours or not. But if you believe it, it becomes your truth. Not just a truth, not just a random thought from God, but it becomes your reality. It becomes your truth. And truth becomes flesh or it becomes manifested. So we give birth to the word every time we speak it. Every time we believe, it will be unto us even as he has spoken. That glorifies God. And that brings manifestation. That makes Christmas a perpetual, ongoing reality every day of our lives. And like Mary, blessed are we that believe. Yes. And then Luke 145 says, praise the Lord. All things are possible. And blessed is he, she that believe, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Because she believed, it will be done. Just as God said it. Had she not believed it, it wouldn't happen. God has given us that kind of authority and power in this earth. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I know we're living in a weird, weird time. And I've lived in some weird times over my lifetime. We all have. But this is one of the weirdest outside of... I think Vietnam, just where, in terms of angst and stress and that sort of thing. We're dealing with COVID-19, something most of us don't really understand what it is, where it came from, what it's all about. Election chaos, stress, anxiety over not being able to be together and have normalcy, you know, with family and friends and jobs and all the other stuff. A derecho that took out a half a dozen trees on our property and still trying to recover from all of that and fix everything back up and to get it to some kind of normalcy. Violent demonstrations, uncertainty, and fear. Say, thank you, Nathan. You're really picking up our spirits this morning. But I want you to understand something, that God has given us the power to overcome anything and everything, no matter what it is. Wars, rumors of wars, all the things that we deal with in life. Now let's look quickly to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews 3, verses 5 through 8. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. Yes. That's it. We've heard from the Lord all over here this morning. So, yes. I mean, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony or for the words of those things which were to be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm or the hope that's in the word unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Trust what God has said, no matter what we're seeing around us, no matter what it looks like. Amen. First Kings chapter 19, and we'll read verses 7 through 16, Peter. First Kings 19, 7 through 16. We've all, you, you all know these scriptures, so it's not like I'm, I'm breaking ground here on new scriptures. But I do want us to put these scriptures in the context of the season that we're in and what God is trying to speak to each of our hearts Amen. So the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. This is speaking of Elijah and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. He arose and he did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. 
And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Praise God. It was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenants, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Japhat of Abimeloah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Praise the Lord. And after the fire, a still small voice. So after experiencing one of his greatest victories, Elijah gets a note from Mrs. Ahab, Jezebel. And the message was short and to the point. Look at 1 Kings uh, 19 verses 1 and 2, Peter. So she sends the note and it says, Ahab, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So as the rest of the prophets are is what she's saying, which being interpreted meant dead. So shall you be tomorrow. And what did Elijah do, this man of God, who had slain the, he freaked out. He panicked and he ran. Now, I don't think Jezebel really wanted to kill Elijah. I mean, she could have just sent an assassin. She didn't have to send a, a scary note. What she wanted is what she got. By frightening him into running away, Israel would see him as a coward. And therefore, their God as limited. Elijah was worn out. He was scared. He was running away. An angel fed him. And he made a 40-day forty journey to Horeb based on what that angel had given. And that's where he caved in. Pressure can do that to you. You can only run so long. You can only carry the burden alone for so long, and then you cave in. Elijah went into a dark place. He went into a cave, avoiding the light. And he had a solitary pity party. Anybody had one of those? But out of that darkness, God showed up. And he said, what are you doing here? And God wasn't talking about the cave. And he wasn't talking about Horeb. He was talking about Elijah's spiritual condition, the position he was in. He was talking about, why are you in this condition, Elijah? Come out here and stand. So Elijah went and stood just like the Lord had told him to. And look at this in 1 Kings, uh, Peter 19 and verse 13. This is amazing to me. He comes out. He hears the voice of God. He responds to that voice of God. And when he heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, <clears throat> excuse me, and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know, the face of the prophet, if you read uh, the, uh, the Hebrew uh, traditions, the face of the prophet represented his calling. And when Elijah wrapped his face in his mantle, he was trying to hide his calling. He was covering his ears from what he was hearing. And it's weird that in all the other situations he'd been through, he never did this. He never wrapped his face in his mantle. He never covered himself up. It was that still small voice that brought this response. Because a word 
prevailed over wind, prevailed over fire, and prevailed over the earthquake. And today we can know that a word from the Lord is more powerful than any force of nature or man. From the word, Elijah got direction for his purpose. The voice of God, even in a small way, is more powerful than any circumstance or situation that we face. And forgive me if I'm a little emotional. I, don't, I hate this when it happens. But I'm telling you, I'm feeling the Lord. <laughs> and I have ever since he began speaking to me about this. God is not in every wind. He's not in every fire. And he's not in the earthquakes. God is not in COVID-19. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You can get one word from God, and it's more powerful than what you're seeing, what you're feeling, what you're hearing. Just as Don said, these are the sense realm, and we're not tied to this. We're in this, but we're not of this. Faith isn't believing God in spite of circumstances, folks. Real faith is believing and acting on God's word in spite of consequences. For example, Isaac didn't have a, a, a lot of answers, but he yielded to the circumstances. And he did it on the basis of a word. Genesis 22, verse 8. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. The Lord will provide. That's, that's all Isaac heard. Jehovah Jireh. Where's the sacrifice? Jehovah Jireh. Lay down on the altar. Jehovah Jireh. Prepare the fire. Jehovah Jireh. All he had was a word. But it was a powerful word. None of it made sense. But the promise still stood. God said he would provide. Abraham drew the knife. Jehovah Jireh, Isaac had a word from the Lord, and it was more powerful than the fire that his father had built. It was more powerful than the wind of circumstances on Mount Moriah. Isaac could not explain it, but that word was stay on the altar. Now everybody here, all of us, those of you watching on the internet, and I apologize for not speaking directly to you sooner, but Merry Christmas, and you're all a part of this service as well. Yes. We've all had experiences, things that we can't explain, things we don't really totally understand. Right. Sometimes you have to go a long time on the last word that God gave you. Right. It is written, yes. man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. Genesis 3 and 1, the devil came to Adam and Eve and said, Hath God said? Yeah. Satan's always about the business of raising doubts, asking questions. Yes. Jesus, on the other hand, turns questions into exclamation points. It yes. is written. Why did this happen? Are you sure God said that to you? It's written. Yes. It isn't my opinion. It's the word of God. Yes. Look at 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 19, Peter. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19. We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and when we were with him in the holy, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He said, We saw him transfigured. We saw Moses, we saw Abra or excuse me, we saw um, Elijah and, and so forth. We saw these prophets that had been dead for, or we, we assumed they were dead. We saw him transfigured. We saw the glory coming from him. We heard his words. But then Peter goes on to say, I've got something better for you. We were there. We saw all this. But I've got something that's even better than that experience that we had. A more sure word of prophecy, he said. And that sure word is scripture. They didn't have all the scripture at that time. The, the scripture hadn't been completed. The word of God that Peter saw. He said, we saw him transfigured. He was on the, he was on the mountain. He saw the vision. He heard the voices. And yet he says, I've got something better than that. The word of God. How many of you, have you ever had that feel, if I could have just been there, yeah. if I could have touched the hem of his garment, if I could have heard him speak, if I, you know, right. and that's what Peter's saying. Hey, we, we were there. We saw all this. We saw the most miraculous things there ever were, but I've got something even better than that for you. Yeah. The word of God. Yes. That's how valuable, that's how powerful this is. Jesus. It is God. It can't be separated. He is the word. Yes. The word became flesh. It manifested. Jesus. When you have a word of God, you can claim every day, every week, every month, the word of the Lord is timeless. Yes. It, it doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. Visions, dreams, visitations, they're great. And I've, I've experienced them. Most of us have had encounters like that. But I have a word of God. And it's more powerful than any other man manifestation that can come. Amen. A more sure way. Yes. We've probably all done this, and I've done it multiple times. You're reading through the scripture, and all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to you and says, this promise is yours. Somehow it comes alive. It becomes more than it ever was before. And you know that's God's, it's resonating with me. It's telling me, this belongs to you. This promise is yours. And I tell you, I, I, this happened, I don't even know how many times to begin to count, but I'm just gonna, I'll just give you two that were critically important to me in certain times in my life. One of them in particular is Genesis 15 and 1. And I've talked about it before, but I was in a, a hard place. Not only financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually trying to decide what I was going to do. I had resigned the church. I didn't know where to go, what to do. I didn't know, am I, am I doing you wrong, Lord? Am I just thinking about myself? Is this just out of ego or anger or frustration or what, you know? And this is the scripture the Lord gave me. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy seeding great reward. I'm your protection. And I'm your provision. Yes. Quit freaking out about everything and just put your confidence in me. Glory. And the other one is Isaiah 54, 13 to 15. We've got a big family. And you may not know all of the ins and outs, but I had multiple marriages and children by different uh, wives. Thank God we've all reconciled. Everybody's cool and I see them all. We communicate. We have a great relationship with all of them. But there was a time when I thought, like, oh, man, I've ruined it, not just for me, but for them, for the family, for what could be and what might be. And I was concerned that I wouldn't have the influence or that God wouldn't touch them the way he had me. I know that's stupid, but that's what I was thinking. These are kids that I, I didn't really get to raise them all together to be influenced in the same way. So this is what the Lord gave me when I was struggling with all of that. And all of thy children shall be taught of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shalt thou be established, and thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. And I can honestly say before you today, they're not perfect. I'm talking about my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. But they've all been exposed to the word of the Lord, and they are all believers. Not perfect believers any more than I am, but they are believers. They do put their confidence and their trust ultimately in God. And I, if there's one thing in my life that I could say, Lord, if I only get one shot, if I only get one choice, if I only get one thing, that's it. Every morning I confess, I and my house shall be saved. Children grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and all that will follow. Yes. Right. Praise the Lord. That's a promise. Yep. It's a promise. It's mine. I can go back next week, and it'll still be there. Yep. I can go back five years from now, yep. and it's still there. I can look at this chaos and the confusion that sometimes happens in people's lives as they're growing up and maturing and changing and so on and so forth and look at it and go, oh my God, get your act together. But I can know I have a promise. Yes. And at the very end of my life, it'll still stand true and it'll still be mine. That's the power of a word. That is the power of truth. Mark 4.13. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? Verses uh, 23 through 32, Peter. Same chapter. These are familiar, but again, I'm just trying to bring this into some kind of context. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Careful what you're listening to. What you're listening to the most. I'm not saying you shouldn't ever listen to the news. or any, I'm just saying keep that in context. And make your focus be the word of God and not what some talking head is saying. For he that hath, to him shall be given. He that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of God is just like this. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. And should sleep and rise night and day. The seed should spring up and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. <coughs> and he said, and Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when in the, is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. The seed is the word of God, we know that. And this is speaking, I believe... With all my heart, this is speaking to the time we're living in right now. This is what separates religion from Christians or religion from believers. The Word of God. And when we start sowing it, when we start speaking it and believing it and trusting in it, it's going to produce this end time harvest yes. that we've been talking about for 2,000 years. Yes. Amen? Amen? But now... The time has come that the light is being separated from the darkness again. Yes. God has spoken and light has come or manifestation yes. or revelation has come. And we have to operate from that reality. Yes. We have to continue to operate from that reality. We can't just hit or miss like we've been able to get away with in the past. Yeah. Especially in this country where we have some advantages and some opportunities. Right. We have to live by the word of God now. And I'm not talking about being religious goofballs. I'm talking about just saying what he says about the situation, confessing that, trusting in him to be faithful to his word. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Psalms 119 and verse 11. 
is another one of my life scriptures. Praise the Lord. Thy word have I hid in my heart mm -hmm. that I might not sin against thee. Mm -hmm. The sin is unbelief. Right. Right. That's the only real sin that there is. That's right. That's right. So if I've hid his word in my heart, he doesn't see any sin in my life. That's right. Praise God. Miracles are in seeds. The seed is the Word of God. And it will root out doubt. Yes. It'll cast down fear. Yes. It'll calm the anxious heart. And all it has to do is be spoken. Yes. Praise God. We need a word from the Lord. Yes. We need direction. We need to hear the voice of God. We need something that will stay with us next week, yep. next month, yep. next year. Matthew 24, 35. We know facts change all the time. Virus facts. Yep. Vaccination facts. Seem changing constantly. Yep. But the word of God is settled. It does not change. Right. These other things are in flux all the time. But God's word is stable. It's yes. settled. We need to be focused on this. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word shall not pass away. It's that settled. It's that true. A word from the Lord supersedes circumstances. The thing that makes life bearable. The thing that makes life hopeful. Yes. Joyful. Especially in these times. Yes. Comes with the simple power of God's word. Yes. I have my grandmother's Bible. One of her daughters, my aunt. We were, had a get together with some of the family this summer. Because part of them go to Arizona in the winter and so forth. So we had a get together with them. My brother and I. and uh, Uncle and aunt. And family members and so forth. And she said, Nathan, or she calls me Dwayne. She said, I want to give you something. I said, well, what's that? And she said, Mom's Bible. And it was, I mean, she was married in 1902 or 1903, I think, somewhere in there. Born in the late 1800s. Missouri farm kid. My grandfather was a farm boy. They took a covered wagon from... Uh, Missouri to uh, Minnesota border, almost to the Minnesota border, up around Spirit Lake, and started farming up there. Probably 20 acres, 30 acres or something. They ended up having 13 kids. Wow. And it's comical, because wow. when she wrote in the Bible, she wrote their names and their birth date. She ran out of room. <laughs> <laughs> she, didn't get, she didn't get all 13 of them in there. Because it just got to be overwhelming, I suppose. And she probably got, after about seven or eight, you know how it is, that first child, you're going, oh, my God, yeah. oh, oh, look out, look out, they're going to get hurt. By the sixth one, it's, <laughs> ah, they'll, be, they'll be fine, you know, just don't worry about it, you know. And that's kind of the way I think it happened. By the time she got to seven or eight, it was like, come on, Lord, we're just going to have to keep moving forward. I asked my, my uncle said, we were joking about it, my uncle said, I asked Dad one time, my grandfather, she said, how did, why did you have so many kids? He said, well, son. When you were young, we didn't have electricity. <laughs> well, I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But when it got dark, they just went to bed, you know. So they didn't have a big screen TV. They didn't have satellite. They just had each other, praise the Lord. But anyway, God's word is good. And it impressed me that my grandmother, she had underlined things and in the Bible and so forth. And I thought, you know, we think it's all about us. We just stumbled into this somehow. And, you know, we've come to the end of ourselves and decided to cry out to God. The very reason I did, I believe, is because of her prayers. Right. And because of the prayers of her right. parents and grandparents before. Yes, Lord. Yes. I and my house will be saved. That's right. Because somebody back there said the same thing. Yes. Thank you. Praise God. John 21, verse 16. Remember, Jesus 
is the word. Amen? Yep. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. Jesus didn't give Peter a lecture on how to feed sheep. He said, Do you love me? The word. The word of the Lord was simple. Love me. Love my word. Trust my word. Put faith in my word. And you'll be a sheep feeder whether you want to be or not. Love me. The word of God. Now there's going to be pain. Anybody that's lived any time at all on this planet knows it. Circumstances change. Times can be scary. Places can be frightening. All that. There'll be wind. There'll be fire. There'll be earthquakes. But eventually the wind will die. The fire will go out. And the earth will calm down. And you'll hear a voice. Yes. And that's the power of a word. Yes. You're going to make it. Yep. We'll get through this. Yep. I've got more for you to do. Right. We're not done yet. When the di disciples were in a boat and there's a raging storm, Jesus comes along and there's this big storm and he said, what does he say? Come. He didn't say, batten down the hatches, get out the life jackets. He just said, come. The waves are high. Come. The wind's roaring. Come. Peter stepped out and started walking towards Jesus. And the thing that was about to sweep over his head, the sea, was already under Jesus' feet. Yeah. Whatever's threatening to be over our heads is already under His feet. Right. Yeah. Hebrews 2.10 For it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. All things was made for him. All things were made by him. Praise the Lord. By whom are all things? In bringing many sons unto glory. How do we give glory? By believing the word. Mm -hmm. By believing him. By believing what he says. Not what the circumstances are telling us. Ephesians 1, verse 11. I hope I'm coming across as positive here because I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just telling you this touches me deeply because I've lived a long time. Not as long as some, but long enough to know how life can kick you in the teeth. How you can find yourself in the most horrible situations, the most frightening circumstances, and yet here I'm still standing. Right. For, and have no reason to be of my own strength or my own ability. That's right. Got an old friend, uh, lives in Florida now, Dodge, Dave Dodge. Him and I were buddies in, in, in the Marine Corps in Vietnam, and we ran around together for a couple of years after that, tendon barred, both sides of it, praise the Lord, and uh, working in restaurants and different things, just traveling all over. We lived out in Colorado for a year or two, and, then we kind of went different ways. He went to Mexico. I went to California. We came back. We got back together again in, in Michigan. And we hitchhiked all over. I mean, I'm talking about the early 70s, like 71, 72 in that area. We were good friends. And uh, things happen. You know, life goes on and everything changes. And hadn't seen him, heard from him for years, 40 years probably. And I get a letter from him out of the clear blue. He'd been looking to find me. And he found me through an obituary of my brother. And uh, so he sent, we, we correspond back and forth and text message and so forth. But he brought up something a couple of times about some of the stuff that happened overseas and how fortunate we were to be here today, you know, and how there were times we didn't think we were. And I think that's why we were as crazy as we were, because we were trying to get everything we could, you know, in case something happens, praise the Lord. But it, it was refreshing because we're both 70s, you know, we're both 72, soon 73 years old. And how 
we still had this common bond because of the experiences we had when we were 40 years younger, well, 50 years younger for that matter. We were only in our early 20s. And yet, the things that we shared then are still real today. And it's comical because when I told him, he said, what are you doing now? I guarantee you this was a shocker. I said, well, I pastor a church in, in Des Moines. And, oh, he said, I knew that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is not, <laughs> it made me laugh. And I don't know if it did Sally a little bit probably, but I'm reading this thing. And he said, you know what? It shouldn't surprise me because remember that night we were in that storm? <laughs> Yeah, praise the Lord. <clears throat> in Colorado, and that Jesus, that hippie Jesus gal picked us up and gave us shelter from the storm. <laughs> and the same time after that, the next day, we were hitchhiking south to get to, uh, to where we could get to Aspen, and we get picked up by a couple. And this couple, he was preaching to us all the time we were in the car. Now, we were high. We were getting high and stuff all the time. So he's, he's preaching to us, and there's this, their kid was the filthiest little kid I've ever seen in my life. I mean, and, you know, I mean, he was filthy. And he had, they had been to McDonald's or someplace, and he had stuff all over his face and his hands, and he was crawling all over the back seat. So when we got to get into the car, I saw that kid in there, you know, I saw the trash all over it. I want to ride. I'm willing to ride in anything right now because it's cold and it's yeah. blowing and everything else. But I don't want to ride by that kid because I know I'm going to come out of here looking like, you know, I got drugged through a grease pit or something. So I, I opened the door. And I said, go ahead, dog, you get in. <laughs> and he freaked out all the way till we got to Boulder, I think it was, where we finally, where they dropped us off. And we got preached to all the way down there. I mean, he just never let up. I mean, obviously, he could tell by looking at us we needed some, the word of the Lord. But I told Dodge, I said, well, look, I'll tell you this. The, the Jesus hippie girl, it, that wasn't an epiphany for me. I said, I could say that maybe the little kid in the backseat of that car might have been closer to it simply because I remember getting in and th saying, thank God Dodge has to sit by him. <laughs> and he got a bit of a kick out of that. But I'm just saying that's how God brings things back. Now, he was talking to us. There's no question about it. But we weren't listening. You know, we were on a whole other page. We were looking for a ride willing to pay the price. And the price was you got to listen to this preaching. But seeds are sown. Even when you don't realize it. Even when you don't know that they're... Because the heart is, a, is good soil. Even if it doesn't... But I, I didn't know how to produce anything out of that. But God does. If he can get the word to somebody... He can get them delivered. He can get them saved. It may not happen overnight. It didn't for me. It was 20 years later before I really came into an experience with God. Now, I believed that there was a God, but I just, kind of like most people, I didn't want to be inter interfered with. So, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And that's, I've always struggled with this idea of predestination. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't, I don't believe in that. But here's the deal. If my great-great-grandfather or grandmother was praying for me, God responds to that prayer of faith, and I am predestined by that. Yes. Not, not because God chose me and just said, well, he's, this is some, I really want to do something with this guy. No. He's responding to the faith of somebody generations back that he has to operate by his word. Yes. So he'll do whatever he has to do with me to get me into the place that he promised somebody 100 years earlier that I would be. So I'm standing on the same thing for my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids, even when they act crazy, because I guarantee if my grandmother had seen some of my behavior when she was praying, She'd have probably said, well, I think this may be a lost cause. This guy's going to be a mess. But she didn't. She just knew in what God promised. And that's what she put her confidence in. And that's what we have to do. I don't care if it's COVID-19. I don't care if it's elections. I don't care if it's personal issues. I don't care if it's family. Whatever it is, God has a word for us. And he wants us to take that word and stand on it. Because that's our way out. That's our blessing. That's our power. That's our authority. 
Praise the Lord. That word there, worketh. An inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now that's fascinating because that word worketh means to energize. So he energizes all things according to the counsel of his will. And when you get in the will of God, which is his word, there comes an energy that you didn't have or that you didn't know even existed before. I mean, I've, I've stood and done things. I can promise you, if I hadn't known the Lord, I'd have bailed long, long ago. I'm not just talking about the church, but I'm talking about all sorts of things. Marriage, all things that I had always done before. When I didn't like it, I just left. I just said, forget it. I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. Praise the Lord. But when you get the will of God, there comes an energy that you didn't have before. A stick to it. A don't give up. A just hang in there. You'll make it. I'm with you. I got you. It's an energy. It's a power to endure. It's an, an empowerment to complete the task at hand. To make it through whatever you face. The Marine Corps teaches you that, but it, it doesn't teach you that in a spiritual way. It just te teaches you to dig in and hang on. Yeah. Help will arrive. Or you'll just have to fight your way out of this. That's it. I mean, I think of some of the Marine Corps history. I know you had to go through the history stuff too, the military. And I remember in Korea, we had a, uh, a command that was completely encircled, completely surrounded. They couldn't get to them. They couldn't get them out. And they, the radio communication, they asked the commanding officer, they said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, we got him right where we want him. He said, no matter which way we shoot, we're going to hit him. <laughs> now, that's just a positive attitude in a really negative situation. But that's the kind of things you have to develop. I mean, you have to get to the place where you think, oh, OK, this is a bad thing, but it's not over. I mean, we're still breathing. We're still. And we used to have a, 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 an old saying uh, in, the, in the Marine Corps, especially. I know it sounds crazy, but we used to say well, they can kill us, but they can't eat us. I never did know for sure what that meant, but I assumed that it meant we're too tough to eat. You know, they can kill us, but they can't eat us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So there's an energy that comes from the Word of God. It comes from the will of God. And it's something you didn't have on your own. It comes from the Lord. So we may be facing storms in life today. The road that we're on isn't easy. But I can tell you this. If you've got a word from the Lord yes. and you keep your faith, yes. it'll come to pass just as he said. Yes. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 38, verses 1 through 8. And this is, a, this is an interesting story as well. And again, we were talking before church, and, and all of this is given for our edification. Yes. It isn't just giving us history. It isn't just giving us tenets and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. It's giving us the energy to do what God wants us to do. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So Hezekiah, he's been to the doctors and all that stuff, and he knows. He, so Isaiah just comes and says the same thing. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Yes. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees mm. by which degrees it was gone down. Mm. Wow. So he turned back time is what he yeah. did. Yeah. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. Hezekiah says, oh, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm dying. I'm going to die. I, I know I'm going to. And, he, and he, Isaiah just confirms what he's saying. And he turns his face to the wall and he begins to pray. And Isaiah comes back and he says, uh, hey, God said you're going to live 15 more years. 
Hezekiah says, prove it. He, he, he didn't say prove it when he said, you're dying. He said, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying. And he turns his face to the wall and begins to pray. And then the prophet comes with the word of God and says, you're going to live another 15 years. And he said, prove it. I didn't read all of this, the whole story, but that's what he says. You've got to prove it to me. Right? How do you prove that kind of thing? It takes a miracle. It takes God. And so he makes the sundial go back 10 degrees. Now, here's the deal. Hezekiah was ready to believe the bad report immediately. But when the positive word came, he needed proof. Now I've got to see something. I've got to have some evidence here. I mean, look, we look around and we see all this junk that's happening around us. And, and we're saying, oh, my God, what a mess. Yeah. What a mess. And God said, no, no weapon formed against you can prosper. No, this disease will not come near your dwelling. You'll see the reward of the wicked. And we're saying, show me something. Give me a sign. Come on. We're ready to believe we're all going to die of COVID-19. A few weeks ago, I mean, that's what they're trying to dump on us. That's what they're constantly telling you. Yeah. And then when, when God speaks, we say, prove it, show me something. Give me an earthquake. Give me a wind. Give me some fire. Give me a, a vision. Isn't that human nature, though? Yeah, it is. Because it's exactly what Don was talking about. It's the senses wanting to dominate. Yes. Show me something. Here, let me hear something. Let me feel something. Let me know. Sometimes bad things happen. Well, I knew that was going to happen. Right? And then something good's coming, and, and we're afraid to say it. We're afraid to say, he's my shield and my exceeding great reward. No weapon formed against me can prosper. This thing will not touch my family. It will not touch me. No, no enemy has power above God. We're waiting for a wind to blow. The fire to fall. The earth to quake. Trump to be elected. Instead, he sends the power of a word. I got this. A word that will keep you when the wind dies down and the fire burns out and the earthquake is stilled. There's power in his word. And so I'm closing with this this morning. This is what God is saying to me and I'm sharing with you. Take time to exercise faith and listen to what he's saying to us today. Be it unto me, even as you have spoken. Yes. Yes. Merry Jesus. Christmas. Yes. Glory to God. Amen. It's a, it's a powerful time to live in. Yes. Probably the greatest time yes. that man has ever lived. Yes. And he's given us the privilege of being a part of it. Yes. To yes. show his glory yes. in this world. Yes. And I guarantee you we're going to do it. Praise the Lord. He has energized us with his word to perform that word, to see it manifest. The light's going to shine brighter than it's ever shown before. And darkness has to flee in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. Love you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.